The Splatoon series has finally gotten its third game, Splatoon 3. It brings you the old, the stuff that we all love, works well and meshes it with new features and content. A brand new story mode, new characters, updates to multiplayer modes, a card game, new weapons and more ways to express yourself. All of this combines together to create the most definitive version of Splatoon. And if you're like me, then you love all of the gameplay variety and enjoyment this brings, but also, you're a bit of a fiend for the lore and stories in these games, right? That's what I'll be presenting to you all in iceberg form. I've made two videos like this covering Splatoon 1 and 2, so if you haven't seen those, I'd recommend checking them out if you want to know more about the hidden and not so hidden things that lie in those games since this video will be mainly focused on Splatoon 3. But I hear you asking, what is an iceberg? Well, an iceberg or an iceberg chart is an image used to layer information from top to bottom as well known to not very known, with information sometimes becoming more mysterious and disturbing the further down the iceberg chart you go. For this video, we'll be taking a look at this iceberg chart made by JG Ultra, the previous video's iceberg chart creator. And as you can see, there's a lot to cover regarding the game's story, characters, community, and more. We will be going through every entry from top to bottom, all five layers, so buckle up, get comfy, and enjoy the Splatoon 3 Iceberg. Let's kick things off with Official Splatoon Map by Nintendo. On the 7th of September 2022, Nintendo released Part 1, Volume 7 of their Ask the Developer regarding Splatoon 3. In this part, producer Hisashi Nogami, game director Seta Inoue, director Shintaro Sato, and sound director Toru Minegeshi are asked questions about Splatoon 3 and the franchise as a whole. In the interview transcript, an image of the Splatoon world we know is attached, giving us an incredible look into the scale and complexity of the lands. Everything's here, even things we didn't know about, and I will be your guide. The border between Inklings and Octolings segmenting both societies with one labelled as a wasteland and the other as a haven. Calamari County, where the Squid Sisters grew up, is off the map but still labelled. There's a border zone underneath here which houses Agent 4's home, presumably in a town. An Incopolis coastal connector road from their house leads up to the Incopolis area we became so accustomed to in Splatoon 1 and 2. We have roads leading to other places from here like Mount Nantai, the place where Pearl met Marina thinking she was some country bumpkin. Marina went to the mountain every day for a week hoping to see Pearl there again and then they formed off the hook. Lucky for Marina, Pearl made her trips up there to practice her shockwave causing singing, so they were bound to see each other again. They also contact Agent 8 and Captain Cuttlefish from there in the Octo expansion. From there, we have the Ingopolis Tide Rider line. Pearl's house is just outside of the city, and since her family's rich, their house is stacked. There's also a very interesting path, Route 108, from the mountain that leads to Splatsville, going past the Cape, where the Great Turf War between the Inklings and the Octarians happened well before the events of the Splatoon games. Maybe we'll get something about that in a future DLC. In the Octoling Turf, we can find Octo Valley and Octo Canyon, the story mode areas from Splatoon 1 and 2 respectively. From here, we start to move to the left side of the map, going past the Salmonid Swim Zone near Incopolis, which is the Salmon Run area of Splatoon 2. We can see here that there's a physical Salmon Jammer Dam right here to restrict their swim zone from getting too close to Incopolis. Could this also be a way to prepare for what the Book of Madai, Chapter 10, Verse 10 is prophesying as shown in Splatoon 2's 17th Sunken Scroll? 
You know, when the smoke rises from the seven seas and the pink fish emerge from the sea, devouring all the creatures of the land too? From here, Hammerhead Bridge, now open, connects Inkopolis to Splatsville, passing the Nils statue and the Deep Sea Metro accessible by Commander Tata and the Inkopolis Underground. We have the Outer Splatlands Desert in the north, Anarchy Bay, and the Salmonid Swim Zone in the south where we do salmon runs in Splatoon 3. We can also find Splatsville, our new home, a bustling city where we can participate in turf wars, training, splatfests, salmon runs, table turf battles, buy gear, buy stuff for our lockers, giant porta potty and really, just hang out. And finally, we have the crater, where the start of the story mode takes place before we're taken to Alterna, the last resort. It really puts it all into perspective just how much there is and how many places we go to and are referenced over the three games. So let's go visit Alterna, the main area for Splatoon 3 story mode, Return of the Mammalians. After investigating the fuzzy ooze around the crater, Captain Cuttlefish, the new Agent 3, and Lil Buddy get dragged into Alterna, one of humanity's last shelters built in the depths of a volcanic crater. The humans built a society where they wanted to survive, preserve their already gathered knowledge, and prosper again. They built the AI Orca, which acted as a keeper of humanity's collective knowledge, knowledge that Commander Tata, the AI antagonist from Splatoon 2's Octo expansion, was presumably supposed to pass down to the next capable species, and it talks to us during Splatoon 3's story mode, chiming in every now and again, but most importantly, giving us access to the Alterna logs, logs that inform us of humanity's fate. The humans also refined the body fluids of the squids that lived in the volcano's ocean and turned them into liquid crystals. The crystals reacted to the humans' thoughts and feelings by projecting images of their desires, the surface of the earth, which were used to create Alterna's artificial sky. I'll get into all of that later. With Craig Cuttlefish missing and it being revealed to us that he's no longer the captain, the new new Squid Beak Splatoon made up of Agent 1 aka Kelly, Agent 2 aka Marie, the Captain, the new Captain formerly known as Agent 3, and the new Agent 3 go through the 6 Altona sites to rescue Cuttlefish. We don't see anything from Agent 4, Agent 8, Pearl or Marina but the Splatoon does get help from Lil Buddy. You know, just a little bit of help. And some help from Deep Cut the Anarchy Splatcast presenters of Splatsville, consisting of Shiva, Fry, and Big Man. As well as being presenters, they're secretly bandits who steal treasure, sell them, and share the profits with those who aren't so fresh in Splatsville. And they take a small cut too. So let's take a closer look at each member. Shiva. She's an octoling that can be a bit cold, cuckoo -cool crazy, and has allied herself with sharks as we see in Splatoon 3's Sunken Scroll 3 and her boss fight. She rides Master Mega who attacks for her, a clear reference to a Megalodon, an extinct shark species known for its size. Her name refers to shivering, being cold, and is a clear reference to her cool colour design with the occasional craziness in personality and in her eyes. And most importantly, a shiver is the term for a group of sharks. In other languages, her name also references sharks, and if you're Spanish, you get Megan. Fry, on the other hand, is an inkling, pretty much Shiver's opposite. She's loud, extroverted, and knows the ways of the Onaga clan's moray eel manipulation as shown in Splatoon 3's Sunken Scroll 11. We see this in her boss fight as she attacks Agent 3 with eels. Her name derives from the word fry, a method used to cook food, heat, hot, the opposite of cold, and of course, fry is the term used to describe a group of eels. In other languages, her name also references eels, and if you're Spanish, Angie. And finally, we have the legend, Big Man, the Manta Ray, the first we've seen of his kind. He's the Splatcast's hype man who usually reacts to his other co-host dialogue in entertaining ways, even acting as a sort of backdrop for them at times. As seen in Splatoon 3's Sunken Scroll 12, he's part of the Manta Clan and this is their early morning ritual to enhance the mind, body, and bodily toxins. Nice, and hey, maybe this ritual helps him do whatever... uh... whatever this is during his boss battle. 
His name's origin probably comes from what he is, a manta ray. Big manta ray, big manta, big man. In other languages, his name mainly references the fact that he is a manta ray, and if you're Spanish, you get... Rayan. I just love the Spanish translations of their names. They're strangely cute, unique, and I would say they're very fitting for them. We also confirm that Fry and Big Man are part of clans, which begs the question, is Shiva part of one too? Probably. Take a look at Splatoon 3 Sunken Scroll 2. Long ago, our splattered lands were almost washed away by a great flood. All was presumed lost, until three lights appeared and united to consume the disaster. Thankful for their salvation, the townsfolk threw a festival with three portable shrines as a tribute. Those logos sure do look like clan insignia, and look at what they did. Some sort of swirling formation to consume? Now looking at each of their designs, you could argue that each announcer is based on a culture of some kind. Shiva, Japanese, Fry, Middle Eastern or Indian, and Big Man, Brazilian. If this is the case, then the inspirations from these cultures create some very creative and fun personalities attached to these characters. And here's a fun fact, they'll recognize you as Agent 3 in Splatsville after you've beaten the story mode when you walk up to their Splatcast room window, waving and saying hello differently compared to if you hadn't beaten it. In the story mode, despite starting off as pseudo-antagonists, they help out during the final section of the game leading to the final fight. And then, the great Zapfish is returned, having been taken by... Mr. Grizz. Mr. Grizz's reveal. After Agent 3 beats Shiva, the Site 4 boss, Mr. Grizz, out of all people, reveals himself as Cuttlefish's kidnapper. So Agent 3 goes through Sites 5 and 6 to get to the final section of the game. The captain cuts through the fuzzy ooze and Agent 3 climbs their way to the rocket. On the way, we find Cuttlefish, dehydrated by Grizz, and then... Look, I think we all had our theories on who Grizz would be and if he would have any part in Splatoon 3 story mode. I even touched on these ideas in my Splatoon Iceberg Part 2 video, making the assumption that the Salmonids will be a vital part of the story mode and Grizz will either be an ally or a foe. Well, Grizz is definitely a foe. There were theories out there that Grizz would be revealed to be a bear, mainly due to the bear posters we see on the Ark Polaris Salmon Run map. I always thought it would be ridiculous for him to be a bear, but you know what? I think it works. His design and how he's handled in the story fits in very well and caught me way off guard. It was all a possibility and even then, I didn't see it coming. I also didn't see the amount of corporate talk and jokes he makes coming either. It always gave me a chuckle. But what about the Salmonids? They aren't exactly a vital part of the story, but rather, Lil Buddy and the Golden Eggs are. Splatoon 3, Sunken Scroll 8 Salmon is mature by returning to the waters where they were spawned. Sometimes, in very rare cases, a young Salmonid will stray too far from their original school during a run and become lost. Their wandering quest to return home can lead to prolonged starvation and an insatiable appetite. We can confidently assume that our small fry, Lil Buddy, has lost their way to their spawning grounds causing this insatiable hunger, but without them, Agent 3 wouldn't be able to progress through each site, and we wouldn't have been able to defeat Grizz in space with our small fry powering up into huge fry, Lil Buddy, Big Buddy, and three lights, again, uniting to consume a disaster. First in the splattered lands and now here in space against a world-ending threat that would have turned Earth into a giant fuzzball turning every land creature into a mammal. Oh, but none of this could have happened either if it weren't for DJ Octavio flying in to stop Agent 3 and Lil Buddy from plummeting back to Earth and for remixing Calamari Incantation. Again. The 3 mix, beautifully incorporating his style, deep cuts, and of course, the Squid Sisters. He's just an absolute legend. He was accused of stealing the great Zapfish by Cuttlefish, was defeated and still helped Agent 3 defeat Grizz to save his Octarians and the world. But how did Grizz accumulate all of this power? The ooze? The rocket ship? 
By using the golden eggs, unsuspecting Inklings and Octolings collected under Grizz Code during Splatoon 2s and Splatoon 3s, Salmon runs as a potent energy source alongside the Great Zapfish. Ironically, the golden eggs and a Salmonid gave him his doom and the return of the Mammalians was stopped. Even so, we can still participate in Salmon runs, so who's in charge of Grizzco now? I'll explain later in the video. Moyai lockers and other meme lockers. Going back to Splatsville, the lobby area. Through this door here leads to the locker area where you can view friends and other players lockers. It doesn't have much functionality but it's neat. You can get things to put in your locker by going to Hot Lantis and buying stuff from Harmony, by finding things in the story mode, or by using the shell drone, unlocked after beating story mode. There's a lot of goofy stuff you can find and buy, so naturally, people have taken advantage of that in the form of meme lockers. The biggest one we've seen is the Moyai lockers. Whether it's just the Moyai by itself, kitted out, or threatening the player, they're there. We have other lockers too, like ones with just a gun in them, specific items, and so on. Why not go forth and make an absolute monstrosity of a locker? Player Projections Back to the lobby area, you can practice your aim and movement while waiting for a battle or just for the fun of it. You'll also have noticed that your friends are projected onto some sort of the seating areas in the lobby and you can see their most recent activity. And if they, all randoms, are partied up with you, then they'll get projected in the shooting range area of the lobby if they're on it as some sort of 2D nightmare. It can be hard to spot, but the projections actually come from a projector mounted on the ceiling. And you can even see the light coming from the projector. It's a small but neat detail that helps immerse you into the game's world, and you can see the same thing happen in the Salmon Run lobby area too. Weapon Redesigns and Origins a lot of weapons have been redesigned for Splatoon 3 to make them look a bit more fresh and to fit the game's overall aesthetic. For the most part, they're pretty cool. Some have very subtly changed while others have drastic changes and you'll be able to tell if you've sunk a lot of hours into the Splatoon series. Obviously, each weapon in the game is based off of a real life weapon or object. Some of these are very obvious, like a water gun, an NES zapper, a paint roller, a paintbrush, a bucket, etc. Some of the inspirations I think are particularly interesting are the 96 Gal, redesigned with a barrel source from a water purification device, the Trisloshia, a fresh new design based off of a paintbrush cleaning bucket. Honestly, all of the buckets have cool inspirations like the sloshing machine, based off of a washing machine, the Blah Blobber, one of my favorite weapons based off of a bathtub, and the Explosha, based off of a fuel canister and heater. Ballpoint Splatling is based off of a, well, ballpoint pen. The Clash Blaster, my all-time favorite weapon in the Splatoon series. Yeah, that's right, I'm that guy, and I love being that guy, and it's based off of a pencil sharpener that fires crayon ammo. A complete contrast to the Blaster and Range Blaster, which is inspired by a hot rod car design and spray can. And that brings us to Splatoon 3's new weapon classes, Stringers and Splatanas, based off of bows and katanas respectively. The Splatanas are a bit more interesting design-wise, seeing as the Splatana Wiper is based off of a car wiper, and the Splatana Stamper is based off of a wheeled date stamp, although it does look like a chainsaw. As well as every weapon having real-life inspirations they're based off of, they can also have in-game explanations to why they exist. Like the previously mentioned Explosha, made from a repurposed industrial heater according to Sheldon, which yeah, that does fit in with the design. The one I find the most interesting is the Dynamo Roller. Sheldon tells us that he designed it using his granddad's, Amosis Schellendorf's blueprints. It flings with incredible power due to the dynamo motor in it, which also weighs it down a bit, causing a longer swing. World building. It really immerses you into the game's world, and it's some cool stuff. Now to end off the first layer, we have new hidden Salmon Run waves. Salmon Run returns in Splatoon 3 as Salmon Run next wave. With this comes new maps, a whopping two, and a total of three total playable maps on release. Yeah, so the one returning from Splatoon 2 is the spawning grounds, and you know what? I have a gripe with these new stages. 
Going fish in hydro plant is too small and the tide goes high for what feels like 70% of the time so the map gets even smaller than it usually is. And Sockeye Station? I mean, it's alright. The small tower is great for charge weapons and most times there's enough room to move around. Most times. I say there's a chance that new maps are going to be slowly released for us to play too. Other than the new stages, there's new bosses like the Fish Stick, Flipper Flopper, Big Shot, Slam and Lid, Mod Mouth, and Kohozuna, a new reward system that lets you buy stuff to customize your character, and Locker. New gear to grind for, wildcard weapon rotations, and new waves available to play 24-7. Focusing on the new hidden waves, we have three. Firstly, we have the Mod Mouth Eruption. Mod Mouths are a new boss type enemy thought to be the spirits who haunt the depths of the Splatland Seas. But due to the youth of Splatsville throwing bombs into their mouths to defeat them, we now know that they're just Selmanids who've gotten stuck in a pipe and coated in mud. So naturally, they erupt out of the holes from gushes, those grace with the red knobs on them, and they spawn lesser Selmanids from their mouths. They take a total of 4 bomb throws or sudden attack projectiles in their mouths to defeat, and they drop golden eggs when taking damage and defeated. There are golden variants of mud mouths that drop more golden eggs when defeated, and they spawn Kohoks, the bigger, lesser Selmanids. Honestly, it's a pretty fun wave to get since it's a lot more laid back than the usual ones and presents its own unique challenges. Another new wave we have is the Giant Tornado. A tornado appears and shoots boxes of golden eggs onto dry land for players to break open and take to the egg basket. Salmonids will fling around the player and each golden egg collected will be worth 2 eggs because of the long distance between the boxes and the basket. Just like the Mudmouth wave, this one is also pretty laid back and you can easily get around 30 or so eggs each time you complete the wave. And that brings us to the extra wave. The new fourth wave. You'll notice that as you play Salmon Run, a meter depicting a big ass Selmanid will begin to fill. Once it's full and you complete a Salmon Run, the completion music will distort and this will happen. Kohozuna, an enormous King Selmanid boss whose name derives from the Kohoks and Yokozuna, the highest rank in professional sumo wrestling. The name definitely fits the profile. Your aim is to take this thing out before the time limit hits zero with your allocated weapons and the egg cannon. Bosses will still spawn and drop golden eggs, so instead of putting them in the basket, you can lob them at Kohozuna and anything in your way to do a nice chunk of damage. This boss puts up a good challenge as you have to balance killing lesser Selmanids, bosses, and attacking Kohozuna. But as your rank and hazard level increases, it starts to get way too hard, especially on smaller stages and high tide, unless you're an absolute beast. Defeating or losing to Kohozuna rewards you with scales of differing rarities, bronze, silver, and gold, which can be used to buy cosmetics, with the types and amounts of scales you get being based off of your ranking and hazard level 2. Hopefully we get some new King Selmanid bosses that'll appear in the extra waves too. Kohozuna's fun, but leaves you wanting more. Plus, it'll make for some fun variety. For this layer, I've enlisted the help of a creator you may know from a previous Splatoon Iceberg video or another one of my videos. We've collabed before and here we go again. Without further ado, give a big round of applause for Big Marsh! Hello! What's up gamers? How we do? How we doing? Thank you so much to Sunflower for having me. Uh, I'm really happy to be here. So let's get straight into it with uh, lobby takeovers. Ever since Splatoon 1, players have been able to create posts for other players to see in in-game main hub areas uh, via the mailbox. 
During Splatoon 3's lifespan, including the demo, we've seen a few lobby takeovers done by using this same feature. The takeover happens when a bunch of people make posts related to a topic, meaning that every post you see in the lobby is related to that same topic. You have your usual ones related to Splatoon content like Splatfest, but you also have ones that are related to things outside of Splatoon. Among Us and Furries are popular, uh, posts related to these have been blasted all over Splatoon 2 and of course returned for Splatoon 3. During the demo, Among Us was all over the main hub and obviously still appears here and there. However, some of the furry posts were a bit, um, grotesque. You know, depraved furry shit. It's not something you want to stumble upon when you're playing Splatoon of all games. And if it's something you want to see or even post, fuck off. <laughs> Don't bring to the children's game. What? <laughs> this stuff was especially high during the last Splatfest, the gear versus grub versus fun. And like, I'm not saying you completely get rid of furry stuff. There's people creating beautiful, not so explicit furry art, and that's fine. All in all though, it's pretty interesting to see what gets posted and what events dictate that. Cheater. Splatoon 1 and 2 tracks heard in lobby. There are a lot of songs from previous games that have made their way into Splatoon 3 and not just in the lobby. <coughs> Wave prism. Broken coral. Oh, oh fuck, this is one of the long ones. Oh, you sneaky devil, you. Alright, hang on. <coughs> I can do this, I can do this. Okay, Jesus Christ. There's so many! Illy willy, you silly bitch! <clears throat> Alright. Wave Prism, Broken Coral, Riptide, Rupture, Shipwreckin', Fins and Fiddles, Seafoam Shanty, Seasick, Kenosis, Chop Screwery, Entropical, Ing... In ing... Mowing? Incoming? Incoming! Rip Entry, Undertow, Don't Slip, Endolphin Surge, Shellfish, sp Split and Splat, Hooked, Sucker Punch, Split Attack, Ink is Spink, it's a seascape cracking up and meta and meta metal Do you recognize any of these? Any of them sound familiar? Because if you played any of the previous games, then you've definitely heard them at one point. It's nice to see songs return too. There's, there's already so many new songs that it's nice to see some of the old ones return. Canonically, all of the songs found in Splatoon games are made by in-game bands, so the songs wouldn't just disappear. Also, that's one of the things I love about Splatoon: how the lore is so interwoven. Because like, if you look into it as well, you could, there's like the bands like break up and stuff. Like the band from Splatoon 1 I'm pretty sure breaks up and you can see some of the characters in later games. I don't know, it's really cool. Scheming that S or B2 dude in test fire lobby. That S or B2 dude? What? It's a spot tour that's been uploading Splatoon content ever since Splatoon 1 and has cemented himself as a big part of the community. During Splatoon 3's demo, his inkling was found by loads of people standing outside of Grizzco Industries looking like he was scheming something. He was planning a bit of tomfoolery. Immediately it was posted all over Twitter, to the point where Dude noticed and made reference to it in a Twitter post by Milana, another spot tuber. It was a pretty funny situation, and Dude even made a video about it, which I've been showing throughout this entry. Nintendo App In case you didn't know, Nintendo has this all-in-one app you can download for smart devices. It allows you to see which of your friends are online and use Nintendo's voice chat services, and as well, you can get like some game specific services, which Splatoon 3 has a lot of. You can order one piece of gear per day that isn't in regular Splatville shops, look at and create the freshest fits, view your stats, cheer on Krusty Sean, all while on the bike. What? <laughs> Who the hell is Krusty Sean? <laughs> I need to play Splatoon 3, what is this? Cheer on Krusty Sean while he goes on a bike journey with the turf you've inked landing you some exclusive gear, check your catalogue, album, weapons, stages, splatfest, story modes, replays, do your code stuff, change settings, check stages and game modes, and view your battle and salmon run history. There's a lot going on in the app and I'd recommend checking it out, mainly for the daily gear drops, but one other cool thing you can do with the app is you can add app related widgets to your phone home screen if your phone allows it. You'll be able to see stuff like current gear, the stages on rotating, and the rotation schedule from your phone's home screen. Okay, that's fucking sick, actually. Sorry. <laughs> I didn't write this script, but this that's that's so cool. That's so cool. If if that was around during Splatoon 1, I would have I would have had that all over my phone. All over my phone. JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, Diamond is Unbreakable reference. 
Splatoon 3 Sunken Scroll 5 For the Inklings and Octolings of the Splatlands, aggressive action is the best way to make a splash in the local sense. Youths will often dress themselves in a style of delinquent or hooligan to imitate peers during combative courtship rituals known as rumbles. After seeing and reading this, I wouldn't be surprised if it was a reference to Josuke from Jojo's Bizarre Adventure and Jojo's Bizarre Adventure as a whole. Actually, it has to be. It has to be, right? It's all there. The attitude, the exaggerated facial expressions, the Japanese lettering, the uniform, the hairstyle, the probable reference to Josuke's delinquent or hooligan style. Inspired by fashion of the 90s high school hoodlum thug and yakuza. Overall, 10 out of 10 scroll. And for the final entry, we have there's a highway system underneath Splatsville. Underneath this glass area in the hub area, we can see a highway with cars driving around on it. This is strange because we see roads in Splatsville, so why are there some below it? The roads up here are blocked off, so was an underground highway made to make sure traffic could still pass through the area? Just below it? It's hard to say, and it's kind of strange. I get that the Inklings and Octolings are constantly walking these streets here, but to block off this whole area indefinitely in a major city because of some kids hanging out is, is just bizarre. All we do know is that the main hub area is blocked off from road traffic, and there's a highway or some sort of road underneath. And just like that, we're done. We're done, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you enjoyed. Uh, thank you again to Sunflower for having me. He's really great. I hope you enjoyed the video. The video is... Ooh, such a fucking banger so far, man. I've been loving it. Woo! Um, if you want to check out my stuff, you can go over to Big Marsh on YouTube. Or my Twitch, Big Marsh TV. A big thanks to Big Marsh for covering Layer 2. He's an awesome guy that makes great content on his channel and in his streams. So if you think you'd be interested in what he makes, why not give him a watch and subscribe? Humans. I said I would talk about their fate, so here we go. All of this can be read in the Alterna logs found through playing Splatoon 3 story mode. Log 001 The Fall of Humanity. As technology advanced at an exponential rate, so too did prosperity, and ultimately, conflict. Before long, the entire world was embroiled. In the end, nearly all life on Earth was wiped out. As humans squabbled, natural disasters intensified. Volcanic eruptions leveled cities, the sea rose and began to consume the planet. Humanity experienced a mass extinction event. Soon, the surface of the earth became a barren wasteland, completely inhospitable to life. Error. Against the odds computed to be 42,791 to 1, some humans survived. Therefore, the planet was only nearly completely inhospitable to life. These survivors found shelter in a vast cavern created by a cataclysmic volcanic eruption. The cavern provided shelter, and a massive pool of accumulated seawater provided life. For while humanity was being decimated, marine life flourished. All manner of squids, octopuses, and jellyfish had propagated in the deep. The surviving humans had found a source of sustenance. Log 002, The Rise of Civilization, again. The surviving humans appointed scientists to lead their new society, believing that science would provide a wiser path forward. Fully empowered, these scientists took on the monumental task of establishing a sustainable ecosystem within the cavern. They dubbed this new society Alterna, and began the process of recreating the Earth they had once known. Of course, not even the scientists are immune to nostalgia. The humans began constructing large-scale 3D printing operations. 
This allowed them to create some of humanity's favorite artifacts within the confines of Alterna. Additionally, they created a robust information management system designed to indelibly record all of humanity's precious knowledge. Such a system would naturally require some sort of record keeper, a computer that could autonomously observe and record data. The scientists achieved their aim with the development of Orca, also known as the Omniscient Recording Computer of Alterna. Log 003, A New Sky As life in Alterna moved forward, one scientist discovered a new way to make liquid crystals from the bodily fluids of squids. These new crystals could change color in response to faint and fleeting electrical signals emitted by living organisms. To put that in more human terms, these crystals could read minds, and then output imagery that matched the viewer's innermost thoughts. Humans were enchanted with this new invention and began mass-producing the crystals. Eventually, they lined the walls and roof of Alterna. As the crystals absorbed the collective desires of those in Alterna, they assumed the appearance of the sky as it was seen on the surface long ago. At last, after 25 years of being confined beneath the earth, humanity could once again look up and see the sky. Log 004, Humanity's Final Day The years passed with prosperity. The population of Alterna grew like a rising tide. The scientists, now elders of their kind, believed they had done all they could to advance the civilization of Alterna. They began selecting new leaders to succeed them, entrusting to them the world they helped to build. Humanity's new leaders inherited both the brilliance of their predecessors and their unquenchable thirst for innovation. This new generation, born and raised in deep Alterna, would prove to be every bit the match of those they were to succeed. They soon grew restless at the sight of the liquid crystal sky, believing they deserved to behold the reality that existed outside the cavern. The elders, who knew what awaited outside the safe haven of Alterna, issued stern warnings to the brash young scientists. Nevertheless, the young scientists pressed on with their plan, the construction of a massive rocket ship to escape Alterna. Sadly, as the boosters were ignited for the first time during a launch test, tragedy struck. The energy from the rocket boosters overloaded the cavern's liquid crystals. A violent and terrible chain reaction ensued. Without warning, the stone walls of the cavern began to shatter, raining debris down on humanity. Alterna, the last civilization of once prosperous humanity, was no more, and those few who escaped the carnage would soon follow it into death. You'd think, after what we've read, that this rebuilding of human society in a cavern was humanity's final chance at survival, but if you complete the final secret level of the story mode, which requires a lot of hard work, skill, and patience, you will unlock a secret alterna log. Log.exe Recall, for a moment, the first apocalypse that devastated the human race. Those who escaped into the caverns of Alterna were not the sole survivors. There were others who escaped via a giant rocket ship, the Ark Polaris. Launched in the nick of time, this ship was laden with many of Earth's species that had been placed in a cold sleep. The mission was simple, find another planet to replace the Earth. Considering the circumstances of its launch, the Polaris had a smooth voyage until it reached the edge of the solar system. It was at that point that debris struck the vessel, damaging its navigation system. The crew was able to turn the ship around and head back toward Earth, but the effort was in vain. There was not enough fuel to attempt a landing. The Ark Polaris drifted aimlessly for 10,000 years. Eons passed. The once stable orbit of Polaris decayed over time until the ship found itself in the inescapable pull of the Earth's gravity. Reentry was not kind to its inhabitants. All perished, save one. The humans of Alterna and the humans of the Ark Polaris all met with a terrible fate. Humanity truly is no more. If the name Ark Polaris rings a bell, then there's a good reason for it. I mentioned it earlier in the video because Ruins of Ark Polaris is a playable stage in Splatoon 2 Salmon Run. This area has the ruins of the ship floating in the water and something peculiar. I also mentioned that we can find signs warning us of an active bear area. 
What makes these signs such anomalies is that they're warnings to be careful of a mammal, and they're written in English, a stark contrast to everything else found in Splatoon. And now we know why we saw those warnings. Now the name of the ship is important as well. Ark, most likely a reference to Noah's Ark, the vessel that Noah built to save himself, his family, and the world's animals from a flood that God unleashed on the world in the book of Genesis. The Ark Polaris did have animal life on board other than human life, and the ship did fly away from a disaster on Earth. So there are some similarities. Now that brings us to Polaris, a star that's part of the Ursa Minor star constellation. Ursa is also the Latin word for bear. One big bear, one small bear, Ursa Minor, Ursa Major. Could it all be related somehow? I talked about some of this stuff in my other Splatoon Iceberg video, specifically the part 2 one, so it's pretty cool to see some of this stuff start to make more sense. What might also be interesting to point out is that we get two bear signs, but we know that there were at least three bears on the ship. Could these two things have nothing to do with each other, or is there more to Grizz being an Earth sign anomaly? But going back to log.exe, I didn't read it all. The one creature that survived Ark Polaris's crash landing was... You'll find out later. But you can already guess who that was. How Inklings came to be. One thing I chose to not mention until now is that there are a total of 7 Alterna Logs, and this entry relates to Logs 5 and 6. Log 005, Fresh Intelligence Awakens. As the inner walls of Alterna collapsed, thousands of tons of rock and liquid crystals plunged into the waters below. As these crystals washed to and fro among the flotsam and jetsam of humanity's former colony, they broke into microscopic fragments. Because they had repeatedly absorbed and reflected humanity's wishes over so many years, the crystals now retained those… feelings. Little by little, the squids, octopuses, and assorted sea creatures that thrived in the waters of Alterna absorbed these crystals into their bodies. This process continued until, one day, the marine organisms began to feel… something. Something… fresh. These fresh impulses bore a striking resemblance to humanity's passive desire to return to the Earth's surface. Spurred by these impulses and whatever else may have been floating in the polluted waters, the sea creatures began to evolve rapidly. Each species developed pulmonary respiration, mobility, and other traits consistent with land-dwelling creatures. They began to adapt. Their intelligence grew at a remarkable pace across generations. Some species even gained extraordinary camouflage capabilities. A point of no return arrived. The sea creatures of Alterna set foot on dry land and never looked back. Like humans, they strove for the surface. Of course, survival on land was harsh, but the creatures were persistent. Soon, they found the tunnels that humans had used to escape the apocalypse. With their path forward now clear, these fresh, fledgling beings left the ruins of Alterno behind and set their sights on the surface world. Log 006, the land of fresh beginnings. The beings that emerged from the water soon emerged from the cavern of Alterno itself. From there, they flourished quickly. It wasn't long before they had explored every corner of the world. This epical event gave great significance to the crater above Alterna and its surrounding territories, now referred to as the Splatlands. The region would, from that point on, be known as the Land of Fresh Beginnings among the creatures that now thrive on the surface. These newly evolved beings, having scattered themselves across the globe, soon gave rise to distinct cultures and unique ways of life. Out of all the species now roaming the Earth, squids and octopuses soon distinguished themselves via intelligence and fresh vibes, so to speak. It wasn't long before they became the apex species of the planet. Now, I must fast forward a bit. 5,000 years later, a peculiar individual was born. This squid quickly rose to fame in the Splatlands due to some… unique characteristics. Yes, this individual was embraced as a prophet gifted with numerous revelations that they shared among their fellow squids. It was another turning point for squid kind. During this period, the foundations for modern cephalopod civilization were laid. That individual squid is now widely known and celebrated as the progenitor of the modern-day inkling. 
And that's how Sea Life became landlubbers. All of the mystery surrounding how this came to be has been answered. Not the explanation I was expecting, but it's unique and works nonetheless. What do you think of the explanation? Do you like it? Do you hate it? If you had a theory on all of this, how good was your guess? Let us know in the comment section down below. Continuing on with talk of Alterna, Alterna Skybox. The Skybox in Alterna has what I believe to be two anomalies on it. Firstly, this massive black shape of nothingness surrounded by glitchy crystals. Alterna Log 004 explained that these crystals that surrounded Alterna were overloaded during a rocket launch test. A violent and terrible chain reaction ensued and the walls of the cavern shattered, raining debris on Earth's last remaining humans. So then, why does the skybox look mostly clean? You'll even have noticed that the ground level of Alterna still has broken and sunken remnants of humanity. But I think that Grizz attempted to clean up the place seeing as it's not a complete mess and the sky is mostly back. But this point in the skybox isn't fixed, so maybe it's unfixable. Or maybe it's the first point in which the crystals started to overload. A reminder. Now the second anomaly is where things get a little spicy. Look at the shape of this cloud right here. Does that not look like a zapfish to you? Specifically, the great zapfish? If Grizz were to have fixed Alterna's sky, then maybe his wants and dreams imprinted a little bit onto the crystals too. He did need the great zapfish to launch his rocket, so could that have been the catalyst? And could this cloud next to it be a golden egg too? A potent fuel source, something Grizz also needed? The egg part might be a bit of a stretch considering that this cloud might just be a small dot, but hey, I feel like some connections can be made. Captain Agent 3 is confined to This Way and Booyah. For the most part, they're silent throughout the story mode, having Marie speak on their behalf. However, after beating Grizz and saving the world, you can return to Alterna and you'll be greeted by the gang. After some talking, this happens. <laughs> A booyah from the captain. The first thing they say. This is an obvious reference to the fact that we, the players, also use booyah to communicate with teammates in each game, among other phrases. I did state that the captain used to hold the Agent 3 title, and that's because they were the playable inkling in Splatoon 1 story mode. As a side note, by default, the captain is female and has green eyes. But if the game detects an Octo Expansion save file, then Agent 3 will look like the one the player described in the expansion. That's why my Agent 3 is male and not female. Anyway, my whole point here is that in Splatoon 1, we play as the Captain, formerly Agent 3. It's most likely that they booyah because we, the players, communicate with phrases like booyah, and they've been able to communicate with these phrases since Splatoon 1, and it's a general nod to that. But despite this, Marie is able to speak for the captain telling us what they've said, even questioning if we can hear them. So there has to be more to how the captain communicates, right? Unless Marie is pulling our leg and she's making up what she thinks the captain is thinking or wants to say. Mummified Squid Splatoon 3, Sunken Scroll 21 Seems these are instructions on how to mummify an inkling. Maybe in olden times, inklings thought if they preserved their bodies after death, they could be revived someday? But that's... well... There's no way this is a real one stuck here, right? No, of course it isn't. Right? <laughs> Unless? I have a pretty good feeling that this actually is a mummified squid. And it looks like a dried squid snack. Splatoon 1 Sunken Scroll 4 shows us that Inklings went through some sort of Egyptian inspired period, so the act of mummifying adds up. This act is done to preserve a body through embalming and wrapping it in cloth, or by drying a body to preserve it. The second one clearly applies here. I explained this in my previous Splatoon Iceberg videos, but did you know that according to The Art of Splatoon, a book full of official art from Splatoon, Inklings can preserve their bodies by sun drying. And in the Octo expansion, it's noted that Inklings lose their ink and become drier with age. So that explains why Cuttlefish is over 100 years old and looks crusty. Maybe this ties together why Cuttlefish was able to be rehydrated after getting sucked dry, after being all dried up. 
because he was mummified and then revived when his body reacted with the moisture of the captain's tear. Could that be the method needed to revive a mummified inkling? Tears are mostly made out of water, so it's no wonder why we never see any sort of revivals outside of being splattered and respawning. Because inklings don't react well to water, so who would have thought to revive an inkling with water? Tricolor Turf War is rigged. Come on, we've all been thinking it. If the game actually allows you to play the game mode during a Splatfest, you may notice that it can be a bit of an uphill battle for a certain team, that team being the team of four. If you don't know, a Tricolor Turf War is a Splatfest only game mode where three teams verse each other. So a 4v4v4? No, a 2v4v2. A 4v4v4 would be too much fun for Splatoon servers to handle. The team that's ahead when the halftime report is announced is the team of four, and the other two teams play in pairs of two. The team of four spawn in the middle of the stage with the other team spawning on the other sides, and then a turf war is played out. There's also an ultra signal that spawns in the middle of the map, and the team that claims it has their team's idol representative come and rain ink everywhere. So why is it rigged? The team of four is sandwiched between two other teams constantly pushing into them where the middle is. Not only does the team of four have to fight a constant uphill battle, but these matches can have a massive influence on which team wins a Splatfest. If your team's winning at half time and then struggles during the Tricolor Turf War, then say goodbye to winning the Splatfest because the game mode may not be as balanced as it can be. You could argue that we've seen proof of this before the game even came out during the test fire, with Scissors winning at the halftime report and then the Tricolor Turf War came in and Rock won. I know what I said didn't happen in every region, but it's still something to think about going into the future. Purposefully throwing to avoid being the team with the highest amount of points at half time anyone? And now for the final entry of this layer, we have Tacticula's Insane Buffs. Truly, the buffs given by the beverages that are handed out by the cooler are insane. Taking a beverage gives you 29 ability points in swim speed and run speed, and 57 ability points in intensify action, quick super jump, quick respawn, special saver, and ink resistance. For those of you who don't know or understand what action points are, also known as AP, they're a unit of measurement in Splatoon given to a player's main and sub abilities, with 10 AP being given by a main and 3 AP by a sub. To put that into perspective, if you have 3 pieces of gear, all with the same main and sub abilities, you'll have 57 AP in that ability. The same amount of AP as most of the Tacticula's buffs. And these buffs last 15 seconds long or if a player gets splattered before that time, and can last longer if the player using the Tacticula special has special power up equipped. The cooler can't be destroyed by both teams ink, so you can use it as a small wall to hide behind too. Despite all of these incredible upsides, there's a few small downsides. Honestly, I don't even know if I'd call them downsides because they're not that bad. The AP given by a beverage does not stack with abilities on equipped gear, so if you have 23 AP in swim speed and then you get the Tacticula's buff, you get an extra 6 AP, and if you have something like 35 AP, you get no buff. Same thing applies to the abilities that get boosted by 75 AP. I can understand having 29 AP in run and swim speed, but the other abilities? That rarely happens, and even if it does, so what? You go from big to big with the other buffs. Speaking of buffs, the quick super jump and quick respawn can be negated if you're splattered by someone with respawn punisher. That's one of the only ways to counter the buffs given by the cooler, and you only counter 2 out of the 7 buffs while also handicapping yourself with Respawn Punisher since it also affects the user. So yeah, the Tacticula's buffs are insanely good. I'd say it's one of the best specials in the game, so if you have it on your weapon kit, why not play into it and put some special charge and special power up on your gear to become the ultimate team support. Harmony has been a character since Splatoon 1 but made her debut in 3. Harmony is the sea anemone girl who stepped in to run the Hot Lantis general store in the manager's absence. You know, the store where you can buy items for your locker and claim catalog level up rewards. 
She also has a small clownfish in her hair, just like Annie, the Cooler Heads head gear shop owner in Splatoon 1, and Splatnet gear shop owner for Splatoon 2 and 3. Just like Annie's clownfish, it too is neglected and dying. She is the vocalist, synth player, and is in charge of the visuals for the band ABXY, with their localized name being more recognizable, Chirpy Chirps. The Chirpy Chirps are a four-person chiptune-style band, most likely inspired by the real-world Japanese chiptune band YMCK. So that makes ABXY their Japanese name, which probably references the A, B, X, and Y buttons found on modern gaming controllers. And you can see a loose resemblance of this text on their album art, the Chirpy Chirps band tee, and even on Splatoon 1 and 2's Heavy Splatling remix. The band members consist of, obviously, Harmony, Noiji, an inkling and the band's guitarist and backup vocalist, Rayan, a flapjack octopus and the band's bassist, and Shikaku, a crab and the band's drummer. So far, we've heard a total of four of their songs. Shelfi and Split and Splat first heard in Splatoon 1, and then their two other songs, Blitzit and Wave Prism first heard in Splatoon 2. You can also hear them all in the lobby area of Splatoon 3, and they're Marie's favorite band as stated in Splatoon 2 at the Tentacle Outpost. You'll also notice that their album cover in Splatoon 2 has various Nintendo consoles in it, which hints to the band's music being created with sounds from those consoles, among other things. I know I've brought this up in the video, but world building. This sort of stuff is amazing at creating immersion that sucks you into the game's world, making you feel like it's been lived in. Deadfish's songs are about her life after sanitization. Making a quick detour back to Splatoon 2, this theory was thought up by the Iceberg creator himself, JG Ultra. In saying that, he's going to present his theory and take us through it. There was once an octoloon born in Ingopolis by the name of Mitsuda Ahatomu. Her early life circumstances to this day are still unknown. Presumably, in her teens, she began to start making music. Let's call her by her moniker, Deadfish, from here on out. She became an underground hit among Inkling culture. The deals ended up starting to pile in. After deal after deal, None of them seemed appealing for Deadfish's career, just a dead end. She wanted more. One day, after a walk from the harbor, she was offered a special deal. Leave Inkopolis with no music deals, or join the deep sea metro and reach stardom. She, of course, decided to leave for the deep sea metro. That's where everything came crashing down. Unlike popular belief, the tracklist does not represent the order of the songs. Instead, I believe that these audio logs are about a tragedy, a zombification process. This is the demise of Deadfish. Entry number zero, Shell. She's in the process of sanitization and currently, during the process, is becoming a shell of her former self. Entry number one, Progress. After finally being free from the sanitization progress, she's finally beginning to make music, not only to become famous in the ranks of Cambo Corpse, but also feeding into her corruption. Entry number two, Ripped. Her feelings about being ripped and separate from the reality she once knew, and is starting to begin a new life. Entry number four, Zono. She has no idea why the way she is, and is beginning to go insane not understanding her circumstances. Entry number 5, Thirsty. During the sanitization progress, sanitization is to make something clean and well perfect, while dehydrating the people affected and make them well thirsty because they're all dried up and on the brink of death. Entry number 6, Frisk. Frisk could either mean one of two things. It's either searching for something illegal in law, but it could also mean to leap and skip frolicly, meaning that currently, during her process, she's now perfect and happy. Entry number 8. Regret. She regrets her decision to go to Cambo Court, and is currently in the process of coping about ruining her life. So, she made the song, Regret. Entry number 9. Party. 
This most likely means that she's beginning to participate in the Octoling's inhabitants in Cambo Corp, and she's beginning to transform her life. Entry number 11, Above. It's another song based off of her coping, it wanted to be back onto the surface again. Entry number 12, Awake. A song potentially about her insomnia and only being able to make music until she dies. Entry number 13, Shade. Her doubt that she'll never make it back to the surface, and is in a cast of a shade of doubt. Entry number 14, Crush. Finally, being crushed under her feelings, never being able to make it back to the surface, and she finally breaks. Entry 16, Salty. Her depression causes her to become in a fit of rage, going through the five stages of grief. Entry 19, Bless. In the end, she accepts the fact that without being with Cambo Corp, her dreams would have never came true, but at the same time, hoping and praying that she will be safe again. And that is where our tale ends. I think it's a pretty interesting take on the song names, and if we did get the other songs that are missing, maybe we'd get more to theorize on. But what do you think? Is it a plausible theory and string of events? Do you have anything to add or discuss? Leave a comment about it down below. And thanks to JG Ultra for presenting his thoughts on the entry. Marigold To understand who and what Marigold is, we have to understand what staff are and what a specific sunken scroll is trying to tell us. So firstly, staff are goldfish, specifically looking a lot like the Chinese species Runchu that appear in Splatsfield to help the player and run certain activities. As of now, there are three staff found throughout the game. One can be found managing the Crab and Go in the lobby, a place where you can use tickets to gain a boost to rewards in online battles. Another can be found running the Table Turf Battle Dojo where you can play Table Turf Card Battles. And the last one is where you spawn in Splatsville, allowing you to recon stages. Now, Splatoon 3, Sunken Scroll 24. Subject name, Marigold. Nishio Oranda, alias, Anarchy District 3. 3, Square. Poisson Rouge, alias, Rue de Square Square, 19, 6, Chateau Batu. Ranchi Yu, alias, South Guild Province, Tailfin City, Square Square Square, District. It's a bit confusing, but it's thought that Marigold is a name these three share while having their own aliases. You can also get a Marigold Table Turf card which looks like all of the staff, hinting that these might be their actual everyday looks, but they're laying low, looking identical as staff for now, as Marigold. It's obvious that there's something definitely going on here. My guess is that they're criminals of some kind that excel in shady business which might be the case, as you'll soon see. Mr. Grizz's Backstory For this, we have to take another look at log.exe and reveal the only survivor of the Ark Polaris' re-entry into Earth. Bear number 3, an experimental subject who had retained consciousness within his cold hibernation, survived. For 12,000 years, he had dreamed and plotted, fully awakened, Bear number 3 came to a terrible realization. He had not landed on a new planet, he was back on Earth. And yet, it was not an Earth he knew. This Earth, it seemed, was dominated by sea creatures, not a single mammal to be found. In the course of his search for a single fellow mammal, Bear number 3 used navigational equipment from the wreckage of the Ark Polaris to discover Alterna. It was a wasteland, of course, but a few of the liquid crystals that had once covered the walls and ceilings remained. With knowledge built during his thousands of years of dreaming, he repaired some of Alterna's facilities and began researching the crystals. This research bore fruit when Bear 3 compounded some of the liquid crystals with his own fur. The experiment created an entirely new substance with one terrifying property. It could transform any living creature into a mammal. Bear number 3 realized the implications immediately. He could restore the planet to a mammalian paradise. He began stockpiling fuzzy ooze, as he called it, within Alterna's still intact rocket. For such a venture, he would acquire the acquisition of thousands of golden eggs. These were used in the creation of fuzzy ooze, although the exact details have never been recorded in my memory banks. But Bear number 3 had a plan. 
He founded a corporation that would go on to employ locals to collect his golden eggs under the name Grizzco Industries. Mr. Grizz, as he was now known, would pay handsomely for them. With Fuzzy Ooze Productions peaking thanks to the assistance of unsuspecting Inklings and Octolings, Mr. Grizz took the final steps to set his plan in motion. The rocket was loaded. It wouldn't be long now. A grand plan shut down by the new, new Squid Big Splatoon. Grizz's backstory is quite tragic, in a way. He was conscious in hibernation and dreamt for 12,000 years. That's enough time to make anyone go mad alone with their thoughts. Once back on Earth, his worldview shattered, and so too did he. And then to bring his version of balance back to the Earth, he tried making mammals reign supreme on land again, just like how it used to be back when he first lived on Earth. But times change, things can regress backwards, but things can progress forwards too, and he realized that too late, the poor guy. But the aftermath of this leaves us with one very important question. Who's running Grizzco? You beat the story mode and BAM! Grizzco is still open for shifts. So then, what's going on? Well, for starters, you can find a new statue in the Grizzco building. A Salmonid, represented by Lil Buddy's huge body form holding a bear in its mouth, rather than a bear holding a Salmonid in its mouth. With this bear obviously representing Grizz. So it's very likely that whoever's working for Grizz or has taken over knows about what happened to Grizz. We can start pointing fingers towards Lil Judd with around 85% of you also pointing fingers at him for being up to something and around 57% of you thinking that it has to do with Grizzco Industries. Also thanks to everyone who helped answer that poll by the way, I'll be doing more in the future for videos so be on the lookout for those. But why Lil Judd? Well, he has a headset and microphone on at all times, and if you go and fight him in a table turf battle, you'll notice his intensity is just through the roof, but more importantly, he uses a Salmonid deck. Hmm, could he be running Grizzco now? Lil Judd could be talking in place of Grizz using a voice changer of some kind, but that's a lot of effort, especially when he needs to be announcing the winners and losers of online battles. So that's where a Splatoon 2 theory comes in clutch, theorizing that Grizz doesn't even talk to us over the radio. He just uses a bunch of voice lines that play when needed. The same could be said for when he's defeated and not in charge of Grizzco anymore, making Lil Judd's job so much easier. And that leaves us with another question. Who's behind the counter? Because this person sounds exactly like one of the Marigold staff. Hey, But who? My money's on the table turf staff purely because she's stationed behind the Grizzco building, being the closest to it. It's hard to say what's going on, but it's clear that someone or a body of people have taken over Grizzco Industries, and our suspects are Lil Judd, who oversees the workplace like a CEO or store manager, and one of the staff, working as an employee in the workplace building. And with that, I'll leave you all with a few questions we need to speculate on for the future. Who's manning the helicopter? Why can we only play on a select few stages? And why is Salmon Run much harder than it was in Splatoon 2? The fate of Off The Hook Let me get something out of the way first. I always thought that the fate of Pearl and Marina started here in this Nintendo Instagram post made for Squidmas 2019. But where's Marina? It sounds like she ran away considering that the Chaos vs Order Splatfest happened a little over 5 months before this post. Well, as it turns out, she's here behind the camera as shown by Nintendo of America's Twitter post a day later. I just thought I'd mention that in case other people were confused about this post like myself. So going back to the fate of these two, it seems like they're just making music. June 24th, 2022, Nintendo of Europe tweets this out. While on tour, Off The Hook seems to have scouted a few new members and reformed as an act calling itself Damp Socks featuring Off The Hook. Listen to their hot new single, Candy Coated Rocks. 
Hashtag Splatoon 3. Three hours later, Splatoon North America made a similar post, and then there's Splatoon's Japanese, North American, and European Twitter pages post about another song by this collab band, Tentacle to the Metal, a few days before Splatoon 3 would be released. These two songs can be heard while playing multiplayer matches in Splatoon 3, just like other off-the-hook songs could be in Splatoon 2. So, you'd think that we'd see Pearl and Marina in Splatoon 3 somewhere, right? In the base game, we only ever get to see them in Sunken Scroll 22. After leaping from Inkopolis Square to the world stage, Off The Hook has found their new side project, performing vocals for a rising rock band as Damp Socks featuring Off The Hook. Discovered online, their super talented collaborators offered an upbeat melancholy sound that had Off The Hook hooked. So some time after the events of Splatoon 2, Off The Hook went worldwide and then teamed up with Damp Socks to perform vocals for them. And piano? We can see five band members here in total. Some sort of fish, which I assume could be a tuna, an anglefish, an octopus, pearl, marina, and their outfits are looking pretty fresh too. So where's Pearl and Marina now? Probably touring with them. But I have a feeling that touring is going to come to an end, or it's already ended. August 10th, 2022. Nintendo of Europe tweeted out this image stating, Large scale paid DLC is planned for hashtag Splatoon 3. Stay tuned. Obviously, this image has white silhouettes of Pearl and Marina most likely taken from this image of them. And this DLC, I have a feeling it might have to do with the complexities and struggles associated with keeping up the persona and hard work that comes with being a music artist. Maybe Mount Nantai will be involved too considering that's where Pearl and Arena met. And it wouldn't be a DLC without a main enemy either, so I wonder who it'll be. A music corporation perhaps? Will the Chaos vs Order Splatfest have anything to do with it at all? So yeah. We know that Off The Hook has been making music with Damp Socks, and something big is coming up for them. Now I don't know about you, but before Splatoon 3 came out, I thought that Splatoon 2's Chaos vs Order Splatfest would have played a massive role in Splatoon 3's story mode. Just like the Kelly vs Marie Splatfest influenced Splatoon 2's story mode, or that it would have been referenced at least once in Splatoon 3's vanilla content, but no. Did it even matter? Did the Chaos First Order Splatfest really determine anything? Looking at the Ask the Developer Volume 7 Splatoon 3 Part 1 article we looked at in Layer 1 when talking about the Splatoon world map, we can see that there's a section dedicated to this topic. Here's a quote from Inoue. So many players participate in the Splatoon series' Splatfest that even the developers can't predict the outcome. In the world of the Splatoon series, we create each game's design and sound, and the principles of characters' behaviors by reflecting how players have actually played the franchise. So the trends and values in the Inkling world change significantly depending on the outcome of the final Splatfest. Therefore, the chaotic Splatsville is a city that rapidly developed with the arrival of the Chaos Craze after the Splatfest. Well, I guess we have our answer. But this doesn't get rid of that feeling. I don't think I'm the only one who thinks that Chaos vs Order didn't have a grand effect on the game, or an effect described by Inoue. And honestly, it feels like Splatoon 3 could have been made without a final Splatfest to influence it. We have some music, weapons, and an overall setting that is related to Chaos, but they don't commit to it as much as they could. When you think of Chaos, you think of something that goes all in on it. In Splatoon 2, we saw the effects Kelly vs Marie had on Kelly running away and joining forces with DJ Octavio, basically shaping the story mode for that game, and there was a whole story made for those events. We saw nothing like that from Marina or Pearl in Splatoon 3. Maybe it's being saved for the future DLC? Either way, the game could have used more chaos when committing to the whole Splatfests affect the outcome of the next game shtick. Bring back the Chaos Splatfest gear, bring in more chaotic looking gear, some crazy rule breaking game modes, rebellious squid and octo kids, Salmon Run is pretty chaotic with enemy spawns, so let us fight back with more chaos than just Grizzco weapons. The game's music can be a bit chaotic in multiplayer matches, and this one Salmon Run song... What's up with that? That's pretty cool. 
Where's the fast heavy metal? Where's the flames? Why can't we properly explore the Splatlands? Why can we only explore the outer parts of it? And that's where the problems arise that myself and other people face. Expectations. There's so many possibilities that could have come from Pearl winning for Team Chaos. So many insane and chaotic things, but this is Splatoon after all. An E for everyone game with a younger fanbase in mind. Every sequel in the series continues what made the previous game great and adds onto it. So why do something risky and off the beaten path when you can do what's always worked and add a bit to it, right? Famous dance moves outlive humanity. Despite humanity being gone for thousands of years, Inklings and Octolings emote in ways that feel familiar. It seems that they learnt these dance moves from ancient history books, and we get moves like breakdancing, an energetic style of dance originating from 1970s African American and Puerto Rican communities in the US. The Running Man and the Shuffle, dance moves developed in the 1980s from street and rave dance scenes. And then this pose comes after the shuffle. I have no idea what it's called, but I've seen <laughs> anime girls and pop stars do it. And then we have hand movements, the finger guns, into a twirl, into a 90s hip hop pose. A hip hop dance we've all probably seen before. I'm not sure if it's called a crisscross, seeing as a crisscross is a salsa dance, but it might be a hip hop version of it. Either way, we all definitely know the last part to this emote, the dab. A gesture where a person drops their head into the bent crook of a slanted, upwardly angled arm, something that we couldn't escape for years. It was everywhere, and it sucked. I hated it. Fun fact, it's illegal to dab in Saudi Arabia because it's thought to allude to illegal substances, but not in Splatsville. All of these dance moves and more outlived humanity and now all these crazy goobers are doing them. Could the liquid crystals that evolved marine life have something to do with this too? Other than making them want to go to the surface of the earth, maybe other human habits were instilled in them too, like the ritual that is moving your body to a rhythm. It would also explain why so much in Splatoon mimics and parodies human life. So in a way, it's kind of beautiful. A species can die out, but the way they express emotions and their ways of life can be passed on to other dominant species and change in small ways making them the same, but different. Hideki Naganuma could have been Splatoon's music producer. Hideki Naganuma is a Japanese composer and DJ who primarily does work for video games, and is best known for his music in the games Jet Set Radio and Jet Set Radio Future. It's no secret that Splatoon's music and some of its aesthetic share similarities to Jet Set Radio, so you'd think that Naganuma would be a perfect candidate for Splatoon, but Nintendo doesn't seem to think that, so much so that they've rejected all of his offers to work with them since leaving Sega in 2008, even with fans rallying to get Nintendo to feature music from him in the Splatoon series. Here's a quote from Naganuma on Twitter replying to a fan about this. To tell the truth, I tried to be an employee of Nintendo twice in the past, after I left Sega, but I didn't pass. They said that there's no position that I can display my ability to the full. That's the reason why Splatoon didn't need my music. That's a very polite way to turn someone down, by telling them that they won't get to use their talents to their fullest working under them. I say that there's truth to that. Why have someone go all out making that type of music when it doesn't represent the game as a whole? And technically, he's helped compose two Nintendo games while working under Sega. Sonic Rush for the Nintendo DS, a great game which came out in 2005, with the song Right There Right On from the game appearing in Super Smash Bros Brawl and 4, and Super Monkey Ball 3D for the 3DS as a hire by Sega. So, despite not working with Nintendo directly, he has been able to work for them indirectly, and recently, he's been composing music for an upcoming game called Bomb Rush Cyberfunk, a spiritual successor to Jet Set Radio. So it's nice to hear that his talents are being utilized properly, something Nintendo says they can't do. Although, it would have been great to hear his music in a Splatoon game considering what he's made. Take a listen.
Final Level Music Negative Aura During the final stages of Splatoon 3 Story Mode, Agent 3 has to climb up the buildings that support Grizz's rocket. You'll have some downtime in between each section of the area and this is where the level's negative aura comes from. The music. It's so... somber, almost lo-fi sounding. It's a remix version of a tune you'll have heard all throughout your time setting up, loading into, and playing Salmon Run. It's a reminder that Grizz is the enemy, but for what reason? What is he doing that would make him the game's antagonist? As we complete more levels and climb further up to the rocket, the music gets more and more distorted, miserable, despairing, and unsettling. And then you reach Grizz and learn of his ultimate plan to bring his balance to Earth. And that's where the music takes on a whole new meaning. It's a twisted reminder that you, me, and everyone else who participated in salmon runs as happy little workers under Grizzco Industries have been murdering salmonids and stealing their eggs for a purpose. To turn every living creature on the surface of the earth into a mammal. We unknowingly made this idea a possibility. All of that fun, the incentives, the promotions, the capsules, the gear we've received, the mysteries of Grizzco tricked us into being the happy little workers we'd become and that point is personified as it gets more intense and distorted. With Salmon Run shifts continuing after Grizz's disposal, will we all make the same mistake again? And now, we've made our way to the final entry of this iceberg. We have to visit the Ask the Developer Volume 7 Splatoon 3 Part 1 article one more time. Another quote from Inoue. This may be something a bit unusual for a Nintendo game. It is also the year 2022 in the Inkling world. In many other games, for example, the characters do not age even if time passes in the real world, or time moves forward in the game regardless of the time in the real world. But in Splatoon 1, 2, and 3, the same amount of time has passed in the squid world as in the real world. Therefore, the characters grow, the cities and cultures develop over time. For example, this character is called Merch and he has grown so much taller in the 5 years between Splatoon 2 and 3. First of all, shoutouts to Merch and his glow up. Secondly, the Splatoon world that we know ages and grows with us. Splatoon 1, released in 2015. Splatoon 2, released in 2017. And Splatoon 3, released in 2022. That's 7 years. All of the characters we've grown to know and love have gotten older and hit different stages of life. They're all doing drastically different things than when we first met them in the previous games. Callie and Marie. They were idols and announcers before questioning their places in the world, mixing the worlds of Inklings and Octolings, and stepped away from the spotlight. A similar thing can be said for Pearl and Marina too. And what about the Agents? They're older now, and Agent 3 is the Squidbeak Splatoon's new captain. Cuttlefish is still old, but look at him now. The Octolings. They've now been accepted into Inkling society when they were first shunned. DJ Octavio was once an enemy and then put his life on the line for his people and the rest of the world. Everyone has done so much growing over 7 years. Here's another big point. Inklings and Octolings can start participating in organized turf wars at the age of 14. Look at the Inklings in Splatoon 1 and then the Inklings in Splatoon 3. They're so much taller. What could that tell us? That the Inklings and Octolings that participate in Turf Wars have grown up since when they first started participating? Could the average age of Turf War participants have gone up? Either way, I definitely think that it's a subtle reminder that 7 years have passed in our world and the Splatoon world. Things change. And hey, your life has changed over 7 years too, hasn't it? I know mine sure has. Splatoon 1 came out while I was in high school, when I was a completely different person to who I am now. So much younger, naive, I had way less worries and responsibilities. 
During Splatoon 2's five years, I was growing as a person, figuring out how to be an adult. I met a really special person around this time too. She actually introduced me to the Splatoon series, and she appeared in some of my videos too. With adulthood comes more freedoms, I'd go out a lot with my friends, we'd drive to places all the time, and I went overseas with loved ones every now and again too. I started properly making YouTube videos during this era too because video creation is my passion and I wanted to take a good crack at it. The last time I had properly tried to make content on YouTube was when I was back in high school and uh, I made a lot of questionable content but you live and you learn. Splatoon 3 rolls around and some things are the same, some things are different. I'm still doing YouTube, taking it more seriously than ever, I work another job on the side, I've completed my degree but haven't really done anything with it yet. I still go out and hang with friends a bunch, but it's different now since a lot of them have full-time jobs and other responsibilities. Sadly, someone's come and gone too, and I take care of my diet and physique a lot better now. I'm definitely not the same person I was years ago, even a year ago. It's like I've gone through three stages of life during the release of the Splatoon trilogy, maturing and shaping itself over the seven years like I have like you have. How different are you since Splatoon's initial release? How has your journey through life gone down over these seven years? Has it been similar to mine or has it been different? If you want to share it with everyone, feel free to do so in the comments section. It'll be pretty interesting to read about. And in the end, we'll all eventually move on from the Splatoon series. From the consoles the game's released on, the map rotations will end, the servers will shut down, and we'll move on with our busy, grown-up lives. Looking back at what we've experienced as a fond but distant memory. Just like how the Inklings, Octolings, and characters we've all come to love will move on with their lives. With the adventures and hardships they went on all becoming a distant memory.